Doing a Zoom mic check. Hear you. Thank you.
Good morning. This backward work.
Thank you, everyone's patience that are joining us on Zoom. The meeting is about to begin. Good morning. Welcome to the Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area TMA Leadership Group meeting on um, I don't even know what day it is, September 22nd. <laughs> Third, third, it's been a busy, busy week for everyone, I'm sure. Um, this is a subcommittee of the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance. And we are, we do have some virtual attendance. Um, I'm Kimberly Overman, I'm the, the chair. I'm joined with um, our vice chair, Catherine Starkey. And, um, she's on she's, still. She's online, okay. Yeah, she's on still. And then also our uh, PASCO MPO, Dave Eggers, and from Ford, from Forward to Mills. Um, with that, if you'll do a roll call so that we can have uh, a clear identification of those that are able to be here in person as well as on virtual. Uh, David Green. Morning, David Green. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Scott Ferry, Pasco County MPO staff. Julie Ward Pajowski, <coughs> for Pinellas member and a mayor of the great city of Denny. Commissioner Janet Long, Pinellas County and member of Forward Pinellas. Good morning, Whit Blanton, executive director of Forward Pinellas. Uh, good morning, everybody. Dave Eggers, uh, Pinellas County commissioner and member of Forward Pinellas. I already did that. So, <laughs> good morning. I'm Beth Alden. I'm the director of the Hillsborough TPO, and uh, Commissioner Pat Kemp is still en route. And uh, Charles Clue, Port Tampa Bay, also for Hillsborough TPO. Good morning, everyone. Good to be the chair of Tampa City Council. Adelie LeGrand, CEO of Hillsborough Transit Authority. Good morning, Sean Sullivan, Executive Director of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Welcome to our facility this morning. Chris Moss, FDA Director of Tampa Bay Regional Council. And those online? Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Sullivan, would you like to share with us a little bit about your facility before we address the agenda? Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, this facility is owned by the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. It was built in 2004. Uh, so we are landlords as well as a planning agency. Uh, we have three tenants who occupy about two thirds of the building. We occupy one third. We have a staff of 14. Uh, we do regional planning course throughout our region, uh, starting in the north at Citrus, Hernando, Pinellas, Hillsborough, Manatee, uh, and Pasco counties. So we get six counties and 21 cities in our jurisdiction, home to 3.8 million people, cover about 5,000 square miles. Uh, we uh, really work in emergency management, economic competitiveness, um, technology, GIS, uh, and uh, really economic analysis is one of our uh, fortes. We're about to release, uh, Madam Chair, the first of its kind in the Tampa Bay region, uh, referred to as a Regional Resiliency Action Plan. And uh, you notice that one of the bulletins behind me, we have 32 members have joined our coalition that we began in 2018. So we're really excited about the release of that we call it the wrap. Uh, we plan to do that in November, subcommittee of the council. We're looking for their approval in October. And we're happy to share that with all of our governments as a resource that we work collectively to make our region more resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. We, um, I attended the REACH conference that the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council put together and it's becoming readily obvious that we have a, a great connection to how we grow our community, how resilience and then how people get around. So thank you very much for hosting us today. Thank you. Today's meeting objective is to discuss passenger rail planning and coordination opportunities with Amtrak to review the SIS cost feasible plan and our process as well as to discuss how a, each MPO and T, or TPO addresses our safety projects as we move forward. 
So with that, I will introduce Elizabeth Watkins from the Hillsboro, right? okay. <laughs> Hillsboro TPO okay. to bring to us an update on the passenger rail planning. Thank you. <laughs> Good to go. Light a fire. Burn our one piece of wood. <clears throat> Do you want to hear this? Okay. Can you please mute unless you're doing the presentation? Thank you. Good morning, Elizabeth Watkins, Hillsborough TPO staff. And I'm here today to give a few brief updates regarding passenger rail planning. There's two kind of main topics I would like to cover, first of which is a new program out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as recent coordination with Amtrak. So this slide is just a quick recap of the various different coordination efforts of the partners in the region related to passenger rail planning, working with FDA on their state rail plan update, hearing from Amtrak on their Connect Us plan, and as, a, as well as additional coordination um, activities that have occurred in the past 12 months. So the first thing I'd like to address is a new program out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Corridor Identification and Development Program, which is administered out of the Federal Railroad Administration. As I mentioned, this is a brand new program um, and its intention is to really set up a project pipeline for passenger rail projects that are eligible for federal funding. So to get into the funding a little bit, this is a discretionary program. So this means that projects would compete nationally and there are no formula funds associated with it. Um, and as with many other USDOT grants, um, it's a 80% federal share with a 20% uh, match required. There's two kind of eligible, main eligible activities within the grant. Um, one is for planning and, and project development, um, specifically to set up a service development plan. And the second is capital funds to implement um, said plans. There's about $2 billion, $1.8 billion available over five years. In terms of who these eligible entities are, it's pretty traditional with USDOT grants, lots of government, state DOT, state compacts, MPOs, regional pass passenger rail authorities, and of course, Amtrak. The eligible routes are uh, pretty diverse. Um, FRA considers uh, short distance inner city rail to be less than 750 miles, but long distance service, if it's increasing the frequency, is also eligible for this program as well. And the last eligible route is a restoration of a previous Amtrak route that is no longer in service today. So Congress laid out um, about 15 different selection criteria within statute to help FRA guide these investments. Um, and just a quick summary of some of those, it needs to be consistent with local plans, the state rail plan. Um, of course, it would need to show um, positive ridership and financial and economic projections. Equity is also a component in there and realizing um, positive benefits for both the community and natural and um, uh, human resources. And also important is that there's like stated support from a rail operator. Um, that is something that's also very important. So in terms of timeline for the corridor ID program, um, FRA established it in May through a federal register notice. And through the summer and fall, there was a request for, L for interested entities to submit an expression of interest, but they expect to issue a notice of funding opportunity sometime in the next few months um, to do the first round of awards for the program. And following that, um, FRA will be publishing a project pipeline report. And because this has funding over five years, I believe the expectation is to have future calls for projects um, in the future. <laughs> so I'm going to segue to the second part of this presentation, which is all about the coordination that's gone on with Amtrak. But I want to start with just a little bit of, of history, which I found really interesting. So only 3% of the routes that Amtrak has service on, they actually own. That remaining 97% is with uh, private freight operators or transit agencies. So it's a very, very small proportion of track ownership. And this all ties back to the creation of Amtrak in the 1970s. Prior to 1970s, freight rail operators were also required to have passenger rail service. 
But with the creation of, Con of uh, Amtrak in 1971, Congress relieved the freight railroad um, operators of that obligation. And what, what they saw was many freight operators dropping that service shortly after because it isn't as profitable as freight rail. But Congress and its wisdom put two things in, in, legend, in, in law. One, Amtrak would continue to have access to those freight rail lines. And two, whenever there was um, a kind of a competition for use, passenger rail um, would have prioritization over freight rail lines. And as you can expect, freight rail companies have kind of resisted this a bit um, because, of course, their primary concern is on impacts to goods movement. So there is a pending case before the Service Transportation Board right now about the Gulf Coast Line um, to really define what that unreasonable impairment is um, for passenger rail on freight operations. And I just mentioned that today because with this decision, we can expect to have um, possibly you know, big impacts for policies and access for Amtrak and other passenger rail if the Surface Transportation Board were to more clearly define what that unreasonable expectation is, unreasonable impairment is. So these slides come from Amtrak's Connexus, which is their long range vision. On the left is the current service today. So um, there are three long, um, long distance routes that just go one direction once per day. But in their long range plan, Amtrak really envisions increasing that future service within the state of Florida, specifically having multiple round trips per day between Jacksonville and Tampa, four round trips per day between Sanford, Orlando and Tampa, and three trips per day, round trip trips per day between Tampa and Miami. So a pretty substantial increase in service from what it is today. Also within their Connexus vision, they um, assembled this map, which shows all of the passenger rail facilities and operations within the state of Florida. Um, and I'm sure your eyes get drawn to our area in, in West Central Florida. And those lavender lines um, aren't areas where Amtrak envisions having service, but they realize that those are really important connection, connections and they express interest in continuing to coordinate and collaborate because if those words ever come to fruition, they would love to partner um, with connections. So as I mentioned earlier, there was a meeting um, a month or two ago between the MPOs, FDOT, TBARDA, and Amtrak to just kind of all get together and, and, and discuss um, you know, possible partnership opportunities. So there were a few key um, pieces of feedback that we wanted to share today. The first of which is Amtrak really prioritizes that relationship and partnership with the state DOT, especially on service and federal funding opportunities. Um, the Amtrak partners mentioned that they are working closely with FDOT Central Office on the state rail plan and that that coordination is going well. Another point that they um, shared was that uh, they have really three types of service. The first of which is that bread and butter inner city long distance service, but the second is state supported services and we'll get into that a little bit more below. But the third part of their portfolio is they also operate commuter rail so in Baltimore and LA um, the regional transit agency contracts with Amtrak to provide that service. In our meeting Amtrak also. Um, talked a little bit about their focus in Florida and how that's really on improving service between Miami, Tampa, and Orlando, which you saw at the previous slides where they wanna increase that service. They're very much interested in collaborations and improving that service as well as um, supporting that by having investments in Tampa Union Station um, and other, other opportunities. And then lastly, we, we kind of, uh, workshop the idea of possibly all uh, putting in an application to that corridor ID program that I mentioned previously. And Amtrak gave us some honest feedback that based on their conversation with FRA and their understanding of the program, they don't think passenger rail service on the Brooksville and Clearwater subdivisions would be competitive right now, but in the future, they may be interested in, in partnering and operating regional commuter service if that was funded through FTA and had local, local and regional support. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about state supported Amtrak service, that second component of their, their portfolio. So it is kind of what it sounds like. It is where the state partners, state DOTs or other state entities give financial or operational support to Amtrak to uh, facilitate um, passenger rail service. 
what we found is that it looks really different in a lot of different states. So there's 18 DOTs and 28 routes nationally that participate in this program where they support Amtrak service. And it can look, um, you know, it's really a case by case what works for the routes, the partners. But Amtrak really describes this as an opportunity to have a little more skin in the game when it comes to passenger rail service. Um, with that investment, will become um, more influence from the state on what, what those routes look like. So I wanted to give just an illustrative example of a part of, of a, a pure state in the South. So North Carolina DOT really jumped out to me. They've had this, um, this partnership that they've been in state supported Amtrak service since the 1980s. And they have two routes, the Carolinian and the Piedmont. Those routes have four round trips per day within their state. It also connects with through a bus service and other transit connections. NCDOT has a, a mature model, so it actually performs marketing and operations for those state subsidized services and actually owns some of the rail cars. Um, the North Carolina DOT did a study in 2015 and found that there were tremendous um, transportation cost savings and affordability mobility benefits and have continued to fund this partnership through today. So just to wrap up with some key takeaways and next steps, so we really feel like there's many opportunities, both from a funding and policy um, perspective coming down the line for passenger rail. Um, state supported Amtrak service is really essential in competing for passenger rail discretionary grants and, and having an increase of ser Amtrak service. And one um, suggestion that we had for the board today was there's a letter in your packet if, if you so choose to request that FDOT assess the feasibility of state financial participation in that state supported Amtrak service um, for their consideration. But in terms of actionable next steps, um, the regional LRTP needs assessment is coming up and we will be sure, of course, to incorporate passenger rail planning into that. And that's all I have. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. I appreciate that. It, it sort of clears up a lot of questions that we've had over the last several meetings on um, what our framework looks like and what our opportunities look like and who the players are. So thank you very much for explaining that. Um, I'd like to open it up for discussion from any of the any of the board members. And then uh, after that, we will take public comment because I missed that section. So <clears throat> any comments? Um, there's been a, um, a recommendation that we consider sending this letter uh, that is in your packet that's addressed to I just, I just lost Address to Assistant Secretary Brad Thoburn. It's the second page after after the agenda. Um, is there any discussion on um, sending this letter? And is there a motion to approve sending it to um, the sec Assistant Secretary? I move approval to send the letter. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion by Mayor Bujolski. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mayor never, Julie. I, Julie. Mayor Julie. Thank you very much. And a second. Second by Mr. Eggers. Commissioner, um, may I add something for absolutely. discussion? Absolutely. Um, I wanted to bring everybody's attention, if you're not aware, that FDOT um, started this off with us last year, um, or maybe it's earlier this year. They are having um, discussions about developing a statewide passenger rail policy. It's still working its way through the process, uh, but we were the first of those listening sessions, and they've had them around the state. So I think it fits in. Uh, this letter in the context of the passenger rail policy that the state is considering. Mm -hmm. And it also ties in nicely with our long range transportation plan, as Elizabeth mentioned. Uh, we are starting with a regional needs assessment. And then what uh, I hope we'll be able to do is all incorporate common language in our respective long range transportation plans to show consistency uh, across the MPOs for the region. So I think that in combination with the state's statewide perspective on passenger rail, this letter could help um, facilitate that conversation about what the state's role is in that partnership. Excellent. Would that policy be incorporated at some point in time within the state's rail plan? That's my understanding. I don't know if anybody from the department wants to talk about that. When I asked at our board meeting last week, I think there was still some uncertainty about where it was in the process. Um, but it's working its way. And so I think maybe this time next year, we'll know more. 
Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna recognize um, Mr. Mingel, he was working with the, with FDOT. Maybe you could provide us with some guidance or some insight on in your question. Sure, thank you, Claire. Um, I just want to let you know that we actually have been having conversation with Amtrak. It's been ongoing since the beginning of the, uh, um, the, uh, the statewide rail plan. We know Amtrak is a uh, critical portion of the uh, of the plan. So um, actually, you know, we've had several meetings with uh, Amtrak already, the central office personnel and uh, uh, Amtrak personnel. So as a matter of fact, we have a, another scheduled meeting next week. So um, there's no no issue with sending a letter to uh, Secretary Gilbert. Uh, he's aware of it. Um, as a matter of fact, um, several other um, areas. Uh, Oh, good. We're not the only one. Huh? <laughs> we don't want to be left out there. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for that feedback. I'm sure that's um, is very good, very good information to hear. Uh, any other comments? Madam Chair, I mean, do we have a representative of Amtrak here today? Mm, does not appear to be that case. Thank you. I don't think we do, right? No, I don't. I don't is there anybody online from Amtrak? Good question. Is there anyone from Amtrak actually logged in online virtually? I, Madam Chair, if I may, I just have a few questions that I, I wouldn't mind having answered. I, I see the difference between Amtrak today and our future service. I'm wondering how much upgrading Amtrak would have to do to accommodate this, whether it be in their cars or locomotives, or more especially the track. Uh, Amtrak is capable of doing 75 miles an hour, but because the tracks are not upgraded, that that speed cannot be achieved. So if we're going to ask, if our projection is to move more people on Amtrak, I'm hoping that by the time we get there, Amtrak will be fully prepared to save these passengers. Just a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. And I appreciate the question. I think that that's actually part of the entire feasibility study and, and the planning process is to really determine uh, not only how it evolves, how it gets funded, but but how it, you know, what the constraints are. So I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm yeah, hoping sorry, that's I part of it. Sure. I just don't want to book my board to a wagon that may not be capable of carrying. That's, that's well, trust me, we've never been able to get the wagon even a hook to the horse yeah, for in the last 30 something years. So, so at least we're making progress let's here. Let's make right? sure it works. Yeah, exactly. And, sure. and clearly, we want to be, we want to make sure that we <laughs> have a, a program that is. You know, it's sustainable. I mean, that's the whole point of of what we've discussed with, um, you know, with the REACH conference, with with the regional planning conference, and recognizing the various different um, needs that we have within the uh, entire state uh, for resiliency, addressing many of the issues that we are challenged with the growth that's happening here, as well as the risks that are, that need to be addressed for evacuations, as well as sea level rise. All of these factors will come into a place with this type of planning to ensure that that the state rail plan is inclusive in those kinds of things. Those well, kinds sure, of thank things. You. Thank you so much for the question, um, Madam Long. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for a conversation and to the point of our illustrious member from Tampa. You know, uh, when we dealt with CSX in the legislature in 2016 and 17, one of the biggest issues was who pays for those upgrades? That's really critical because the state, the uh, C CSX is, was not willing to pay for that, number one. And number two, they wanted the state and or the governments to take the liability for anything that went wrong because the tracks are a mess. They have not maintained them for years. I think, where did we go? Just oh, I'm you. back here. Well, main thing, he's not, were you around? Yeah, he's been around. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Been around for a long time. Is so, there a song that goes that way? <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to say that, you know, keeping the cost realistic is going to, a lot depend on the locals that they still have the same business model they did then. Without a doubt. And what I'd rather do is focus on what things we need to do and what the elements we need to address before we 
we find ourselves in a situation where we don't move forward. And I think that's an important part of this process is to at least figure out where our stumbling blocks are so that those can be transparently negotiated so that the public and the state and the feds and Amtrak and CFX and, you know, and, and, and are all at the table with a great deal of transparency. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Ms. Alden. Following up on Elizabeth's presentation with the overview of the new FRA grant program, the quarter identification and development program, uh, that could be an opportunity to make those kinds of investments in these state corridors. It, it is a, it's a capital program, capital program, 80-20 uh, split, right, Elizabeth? She's nodding. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the question is, you know, is, is Amtrak a, a partner in that? Where would the 20% match come from? Would that be something that uh, the state of Florida would be willing to participate in? Um, those are the kinds of questions that might get explored through the state rail plan update. Uh, and I think this group coming together and encouraging the state to look seriously at partnerships with Amtrak um, could be helpful. And, and this is an opportune moment to do that. I, I can't disagree with you more. I, when I was up at NACO, I found in visiting with the various different agencies, found that the local match is actually possibly easier to find than not because the interest on a capital investment or the or the financing can oftentimes qualify as that local match. So if it takes capital investment for those kinds of partnerships to continue to work on the state's part, there may be a resource for being able to make that local match easier than we've had in the past. So it's a really nice tool if that should work. Because obviously, as, as Commissioner Long mentioned, if the condition of the track is going to require some capital improvement by any and all of the parties, being who actually funds that, who uses that interest that's paid on the financing will matter because it may actually work to our advantage in some respects. So I'm I'm looking forward to actually in, you know, vetting all of these ideas to make sure that we at least look at it from a clear point of transparency and decide in terms of a priority how we could best help people get around the state of Florida. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Madam Chair, just one more thing to yeah. add. Uh, when we had our conversation with Amtrak, to the councilman's point, I, I think they have a real strong interest in the connection between Tampa, Lakeland, and Sunrail, potentially at, where it terminates in Point Siena and Osceola County. Mm -hmm. But they cited the uh, Tampa Union Station as needing significant upgrades in capacity to support that service. So that was, that's at least one tangible area. I don't know about the, the state of the tracks for speeds. We can certainly try to request that information as we go forward, but the Union Station is one that we know about that they highlighted. Right, and that is a historic structure too. So right. there may be all kinds of sources sure. that we could tap into. I will tell you, I was uh, uh, dashing to the budget meeting last night and happened to be going down 40th in the train started to the barricade started coming down and I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna be here for a while. I'm but I because I hadn't seen the train yet. But the train was an Amtrak train. And I didn't get to to 45 seconds before it was gone. So uh it it moves rather rapidly and that wasn't very far from where the station was. So we could um look at opportunities. There's parts of the track that apparently are good enough that they can travel at great speed. Um, but it was a safe intersection. They were able to move through quickly, and they were clearly moving, you know, passengers through the, through the area on their way to Orlando. So, um, yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see the screen. I can't really see that far. My eyes are not that good. So, I, uh, Commissioner Starkey, you're recognized. Hey, um, I have my video off because my battery is low. Um, I, I was just curious about uh, the Brooksville line and Amtrak because I heard them, I thought I heard in the presentation that they didn't think it was feasible, but you're talking about going from Tampa to Lakeland. Um, so that's a whole different animal. That's not, that's, I guess that's not what we're looking for in, in 
Pasco and maybe Hernando is commuter opportunities, but I do appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to the opportunity to have more lines going to from Tampa to Miami, Tampa, Orlando to Miami. So I did have the opportunity to ride the bright line when I was down at the FAC meeting and uh, we went up to Fort Lauderdale and back with the president and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, and I enjoyed the experience very much and look forward to them coming into Tampa. But still doesn't help us with commuter uh, in the Tampa Bay area. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a little disappointed that that wasn't right on the front of the list, but you know, we got to start somewhere. So uh, this is a good start, in my opinion, getting the state rail plan updated and, and including policies that we would like to see adopted in our, in our region and be included. I think we it's, it's a good step forward. So with that, we have a motion on the table. And if you'll do a roll call vote, please. We don't have a roll call vote. So we do it by consensus. I mean, we have people. Okay, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Catherine, are you good? Ms. I didn't hear the motion. I'm sorry. I missed it. Okay. We have a motion on the floor to send the letter to the Assistant Secretary Brad Thoburn for the, uh, as far as FDOT's participation in the state supported Amtrak service discussion. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carried. Thank you very much. With that, we'll open up to public comment. Um, we do have one letter on, but I don't know if other people have signed up for public comment. Are there, are there anyone here present that would like to speak during this public comment period? Okay, and um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Alden if she wouldn't mind re reading the letter that was sent by a participant in our community. Oh, great. This is from Naki McMullen, the co-chair of Central Florida for Central Floridians for Public Transit. On behalf of Central Floridians for Public Transit, we unequivocally support FDOT engaging with Amtrak to identify and support increased passenger rail service for all of Central Florida. We were pleased to read and fully support the Alliance's letter advocating for state-supported Amtrak service, similar to what other states such as North Carolina and Illinois Florida is the third largest state by population and our roadways are clogged. The status quo is not working. Traffic is worse than ever. We cannot continue to add more lanes and pave the precious remaining paradise we have left. We must think boldly and act quickly to take advantage of federal funding made available with the bipartisan infrastructure bill to increase state passenger rail service along the I-4 corridor, connecting the central Florida region by train, which has been needed and promised for decades. With Brightline continuing to make progress towards opening their Orlando station, as well as other stations in South Florida, now is the time to plan for and advance a modern multimodal transportation system that allows people to travel with fast and sustainable rail transit. Uh, CFL for Transit advocates for local and state officials to coordinate closely with Amtrak and Brightline to improve and increase passenger rail in Central Florida for a more sustainable and prosperous future. Thank you. Naki McMullen, co-chair of Central Floridians for Public Transit. Excellent letter. Thank you very much for sending that in. Seeing as that we have no other public comment, I'll close the public comment section and we'll move to the next agenda item, which is the District 7 Perspective on SIS Feasibility Plan. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Please. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Andrew Morris. Mr. Morris, you're recognized for public comment. Okay, uh, can you hear, hear me? I just uh, turned on my mic. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, definitely exciting seeing uh, like, like some local support for uh, FDOT to cooperate with Amtrak on state supported Amtrak service, uh, for sure. Um, the only um, other state, like states, like well, you brought up North Carolina, but Virginia is another very, very um, important one. That's uh, they've they've done a pretty pretty aggressive state supported Amtrak service program expansion, uh, where they're um, doing some pretty significant investment, like uh, building this uh, like second like bridge in into Washington D.C. and and a lot of and separating freight and passenger rail traffic. Um, 
to add, add more capacity. Um, I, know, I know previously CSX has been kind of standoffish on a lot of different uh, lines in the Tampa Bay metro area. And even I know, I know um, like post Sunrail, they've been like from around Auburndale to Tampa, they've been kind of standoffish about that section saying like they needed to get to that aeromodal facility in Winter Haven. I, I'd hope Amtrak, FDOT, and, Bright, and Brightline would be open to like coordinating to potentially sharing infrastructure along I-4. Because if Brightline is just going to run one train per hour along I-4, you have a lot of uh, capacity that wouldn't be being used. So like it, it makes, and especially since it's dedicated tracks, you could, and it won't have grade crossings, it'll be fully sealed off. And you, you you'd be able to get up to 125 miles per hour with diesel equipment or 150 miles per hour with electric equipment. Uh, so I, I'd hope that like FDOT, Amtrak and Brightline, they would try to coordinate because it, it'd be unfortunate to see if like CSX uh, hold, hold this up or require excessive improvements. Thank you, um, Mr. Morris, for your comments. Did you have anything further? Uh, nope. Th thanks for, for giving me the time to speak. All right. Thank you very much for participating today. Are yep. there any others? Yeah, I just can't see that far. Just, and these are relatively new glasses, but I still can't see that far. So um, with that, Ms. Alton. Thank you so much. Uh, the purpose of our next agenda item is to circle back to uh, a letter that this group sent last fall about the strategic intermodal system policy plan um, that had come out from Florida DOT. Uh, since that time, I think we've all received draft lists of cost feasible projects for the strategic intermodal system um, from DOT. I, I, I know our board has written a, a letter of comment about that draft draft list of projects that uh, would be funded in the years 2035 through 2050. Uh, I think uh, Pinellas has also yep. sent a letter of comment about that. I, um, I'm sure PASCO has, has looked at their list as well. Uh, we, uh, we received the, the list kind of without uh, a lot of discussion and thought that this meeting would be uh, a good time to open up a dialogue with District 7 about how projects are proposed for the strategic intermodal system. Uh, and again, just circling back to that letter that we sent a year ago, um, there were some new types of projects that were identified in the CIS policy plan last year, uh, new project types that are now eligible for CIS funding. Um, so, for example, the first thing that this group stated was we support the plan's focus on resilience, technology and innovation, urban mobility and connectivity. We're especially pleased to see that the CIS funds may be used to support safety improvements. We encourage the department to prepare a Vision Zero action plan for the CIS. Uh, we're very pleased at the flexibility for use of CIS funds on parallel and connecting roads and on transit. Uh, and we ask that the CIS plan include not just interregional transit, uh, such as connections between Tampa Bay and Orlando, but regionally significant transit in general. Um, so on that, on that last point, there, there has been some progress. You have a second attachment in your agenda packet uh, where FDOT has finalized their policy uh, about use of district dedicated revenue dollars to potentially support operations of fixed guideway transit. So for example, if this region came together uh, to apply for an FTA capital investment grant, uh, and you know, figured out what our our funding shares were to build it, and we're figuring out how do we pay for operations in the first five years. FDOT is offered support for operations. 
Uh, it's on a, on a declining scale. I think in the fifth year, it goes down to 25%. Uh, but this is, this is significant progress. This is not something that we have seen so clearly. And this is now an official policy from, uh, from FDOT. And this is not out of the CIST program. This is um, through uh, a different funding stream from Florida DOT. So I just wanted to draw that to your attention as we're talking about the CIS. There are other opportunities to fund transit um, that FGOT is making available, um, but we've certainly asked questions about some of the other types of projects, like projects to improve safety, projects to improve resilience, um, and Richard Moss with District 7 has been kind enough to join us to have a dialogue. Um, and uh, I was hoping that Richard would share with us a little bit about uh, what District 7's process is for identifying potential projects for this cost feasible plan. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. You know, whenever we look at the cost feasible, we are. Um, moving towards the 2050 plan and um, working on that. Um, a lot of the, the way that the, the, the cost feasible is is uh, looked at from the, you know, we, we take our new projects from the um, unfunded projects for the most part. Um, some we have this year, for an example, we do have some projects, some interchange improvements on I-4 that, you know, have come into the cost feasible, not coming through the unfunded. Um, talking to staff um, and, and, and where we'll, we're looking at is really we look at the where the roads are needed. You know, we look at the the, the traffic projections, um, the regional models, um, where growth's going. Um, case in point, you know, out in Eastern Hillsborough County, um, County Line Road is becoming a, a a very concentrated area for manufacturing and 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 Amazon. They've got two big facilities out there, including an airport. Um, access so we look at that and take that into consideration whenever we start looking at that you know pavement condition uh you talked about resiliency you know if we have any issues with with our roads as far as um, flooding and, and stuff like that so we do take that into consideration whenever we do look at all of the um when we come up with the uh cost feasible plan you mentioned safety beth uh, you know I, I was we were talking on the way over here um FDOT spends a lot of money on safety, and I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, you know, using the, the CIS facilities, um, using CIS money for that. Yeah, we would do that whenever we come through with the resurfacing job. Um, I know this region, you know, with the Vision Zero, we're looking at a lot of safety improvements. We, we spend a lot of money. On average, every year, we have about $25 million in our budget to be able to do safety pro projects, you know, with our resurfacing program. We do an extensive uh, review of the of the safety uh, of each corridor whenever we're coming in through um, uh, with a resurfacing or, or some type of upgrade. Safety is all will always be addressed um, with that. Um, you mentioned that you look at the unfunded list in identifying projects to move into the cost feasible list. Yes. Where does the unfunded list come from? And is it possible to start identifying safety retrofit projects on the unfunded list and uh, vulnerability reduction projects and that unfunded list? Like, do they have to be capacity projects to go on the unfunded list? No, no, they do. Where does the unfunded list come from? Well, I mean, we identify areas that have problems, you know, we, and we do listen, you know, if, if, if there's an issue with, with a road or an area, we'll put it on there. I mean, if it's brought to our attention, a lot of times, we, sometimes we don't know everything that's going on out there. If there's a, we look at studies, um, maybe flooding studies, we have an extensive list of flooding issues. That we've got out there and then we work with the counties local governments on that um if it's on the cis facility we'll look at it but we tend to take care of those me as fast as we can you know whenever you get on the unfunded list you're still looking at what 25 years out we would like to advance we, we try to get the safety issues as fast as we can with a known issue 
that if I could add something uh, about a couple of three years ago, we had the department come out and look at US 19 and in Clearwater and, and parts of uh, Largo and Pinellas Park and uh, asked them to consider doing a retrofit study of the frontage roads for US 19, which is all part of the SIS. And the department has done, I think, a reasonably really good job of putting together some ideas and concepts that we're still vetting a little bit on the frontage roads, but they've incorporated pedestrian throughways, overpasses with the US 19 construction. And that all came from us calling that attention out. And, and uh, we had um, uh, Ed McKinney and Richard and other staff from District 7 come out and walk the corridor with us. And I think that, that that's the kind of ideal partnership where I think MPOs can provide some direction, counties can provide some direction to the department, and then they've been very responsive to that. So I'd like to see that continue um, as we look at safety on the SIS. And then I know at least we've got one commissioner here in the room who would like to see some parallel funding uh, for, for local roads on the SIS too. But, you know, that may take some time because that that's going to be a, maybe a heavier lift in terms of getting that on the, on the cost feasible list. That may take some time. But we appreciate that the uh, department seems more open to how CIS funds are being used. Any other comments? I mean, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to have a say, or at least a voice when it comes to, you know, CIS funding. Um, and for the general public, that's, you know, basically the strategic intermodal system, but it's still state roads. And then how it would intersect with our local roads, but it, it is, addressing the unfunded projects um but i do know that that all of our mpos are highly concerned about safety and um so if, if there's an opportunity to um weigh in as Ms. alden <laughs> indicated on how those cis unfunded cis priorities are established then safety and resiliency need to be in there because we have uh, many many roads and in in uh, transportation assets that intersect with our state roads where there is funding, whereas some of us don't have any of that, but that's a, a part of our process. Um, but where we don't have local funding, we do rely on that opportunity to partner with the state. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Mayor, um, I think this enhanced transit that you're considering adding to assist funding. Could you, I mean, it's all written here, but for just the benefit of discussion, can you describe what that means? I'm gonna let Ming talk about that one. He's really the Because to a mic, sir. That's, a, that's a huge thing for all of the MPOs and bus or transportation organizations in our area. And I think we need to understand very clearly what does that mean? Hello again. Hello. Okay. So just introduce yourself, sir. Uh, with FDOT. Um, thanks again um, for having me here. Um, so this policy, as Beth mentioned, is the district dedicated revenue policy. It's separate, separate from the, uh, the, the SIS funding because the SIS funding policy basically provides flexibility um, for funding. Uh, on non-capacity project on this facility. And this particular DPR policy is for um, transit operations because every year the district receives um, district dedicated revenue to address resurfacing projects, safety projects, you know, um, sidewalk project and all that. So we use that fund to match what the federal funds MPO receive every year to address various issues. So um doing our statewide policy um committee meeting you know we try to figure it out how can we be more flexible to support transit so one of the, the the issue brought up was transit operations because historically we don't fund transit operations so this policy basically said each um within the the the, the district um we can allocate up to 15 percent of our dvr every year for transit operation. 
um, the condition for this to happen um, is for each MPO prioritize transit operation within their priority list. And also recognizing there is no additional funding every year. It's just the allocation, the annual allocation being used, you know, just picked out up to 15% of it. And also it's at the sliding scale, you know, first year it could be 80, 20, um, second year it could be, you know, 60, 40. Last year it had to be, um, 25% at maximum for state participation. So that means we are helping the local to get the service going. Um, but at the end of five years, local has to take, you know, take over the operation. And they all have to be new premium branded service. I don't know. Commissioner <laughs> Lawrence. Oh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Wow, that's in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so basically, um, you know, I have to go through the priority, uh, uh, prioritizing a, a process for each MPO, and um, also, you know, um, need to have a, a, a new premium transit service. You know, not just any fixed route service or any existing service. So basically, helps get the new premium service going. So I, I have follow up. Yes, please. Um, so just a couple of questions. You said no additional funding. So whatever your DDR is, and what does DDR stand for? I'm sorry. District dedicated revenue. Okay, so um, I'm looking at you with, uh, we get a certain amount, I'm assuming. <laughs> Within the district, yeah. We... Within the district, yeah. okay. And so what you're asking, and please don't take any disrespect from the question. But I have to ask it. What you're asking is if if the MPOs want to take funding and sway it towards new premium transit, we can, but you're not putting any additional funding into it. Is that what you're saying? I just want to be clear. Okay. Because I don't want to get all excited about something that is, that is now is taking away from something else. Right. Yes. I am giving you a straight up answer, and that is you're correct. Okay. Because we do allocation every year. It's not like we're getting additional funding at the state. You know, every year we we get that um that pot of money allocated to the district, which is providing more flexibility. Gotcha. Um, we've been talking about flexibility for many years. Right. You know, transportation. You know, not just highway, <laughs> but many other modes as well. So we want to support transit operation uh, through this, you know, flexibility. So and it's that's totally why. appreciated. Yeah. Um, the other the other question though is, um, does it have to be regional or it can be it can be any one of our MPOs or us to peak? Could be within the MPO. Doesn't have to be all okay. regional, but you know we do look for major project. You know we don't want to just go ahead and invest yeah, yeah. into a small, you know, two mile long project. You know that sort of stuff. Okay, and it talks about premium bus service. Bus transit because it says fixed guideway transit. What about waterborne transportation that's a fixed route? Um, I think that's something we we uh, we can consider. Um, I don't have a hundred percent sure answer for you, but I believe we follow the FTA criteria, and I think under FTA, I think ferry is a form of premium transit. So it's, it's premium and fixed guideway. Okay, and then one other question, and then. Um, the, the, the final question is, it says it has to be new service, but what if it is service that is on a state road, right, that is, um, I don't remember the right word, but I'll call it congested, but you can probably think of it with, um, that, that's, you know, rated D or F, let's put it that way, whatever that means, um, and there's a service, but we want to improve it significantly like double the service is that something that can also i think that's something we would consider i mean i i can't i know you can't absolutely. speak of, right yeah but um we will we will take that into consideration um if it's something that that you improve drastically and and you plan on investing into that that project because at the end of the day you know keep in mind this is only for operation because you, no, you I'm want to that, that service, you're talking about more local investment into that service as well. So we want to see that, that you're committed. And, and I think that, you know, that's something we'll okay. take into consideration. Now. Thank you. I just wanted to be very clear as to what you might do and you might not. I just want to um, uh, 
point out that this is not a signed policy yet. You know, we have, we've been talking about it for over a year mm -hmm. um, and we drafted and we, we revised and drafted. So it's on the table and not being signed. I just wanted to make sure. That. Thank you. Um, thank you for, don't go away. I have a feeling you're gonna get more questions. Commissioner Long. Very insightful, Madam Chair, thank you. So without raising another sticky wicket, you know, if you look at the trans transit, um, really good public transportation systems across the United States, they all have one thing in common. I mean, let's get to the bottom line. They have one MPO. And if we really care about regional public transportation, that's the only way I think we're ever gonna get there because the way we have it right now, every county has their own MPO. Every county got this thing in their head. They don't wanna give up their money. But the bottom line mm -hmm. is when you work together in a region, you get more money overall and so at some point, and I don't know when, I know we had the conversation before your time, Commissioner, uh, which literally left us in the same place we are in now. But until we get to a point where we can really care about this issue more than we care about our own backyard, we're not moving anywhere, in my opinion. Am I wrong, Ming? Sorry to put you on the spot. I, I don't think I can comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I, have I wouldn't step into that mud pile at all. Um, <laughs> well, see, there you have it right there. No, I, I, I'd like to respond to your to your comments. And I do appreciate the fact that, that we do need to speak with one voice. We've been told that by many, many partners. Um, district 7 is a very big district. And, you know, I have... I only have three municipalities in Hillsborough, but it's still a thousand square miles. And we have 24. Right. So if you were going to tell all those 24 cities that they all needed to be one, they probably wouldn't go there because there's differences in each of our regions. But it does mean that we do need to recognize the district is going to have needs to, on a regional basis, which is why, why we have this organization to begin with. Uh, it's incumbent on us to work together to prioritize what things need to be addressed. And in this case, when FDOT has agreed to use SIS funds for uh, new additions or new premium types of transit um, projects, um, it's not any different than a new road that we would like for the, um, you know, FDOT to help us either expand or improve or increase the safety on it because all roads require operations too. And we just call it resurface and, and changing intersections and, and road design in order to address how, that, how people use those roads. In transit, it's different because it's humans that actually lead to a lot of the operations. And so it is, the funding mechanism does appear to be different. But I think to FDOT's point is what they're looking for is when a, an entity, whether it's any of our transit agency or a regional project, um, decides that it's going to adopt a plan. It's not like we decide tomorrow we're going to go do this. It's typically it's a project we've been in the planning stages for years, it seems like. And, um, and it is our job in each of our MPOs to prioritize those. And then we, we come together to, to uh, you know, agree that of the priority list. We vote every year on a priority list. So I do think there's opportunity. And I do believe that the fixed guideway or new fixed guideway, which most everything would be new, but we don't have a lot of fixed guideway around here. Um, that this does give us the opportunity to come together to try and find the best way to get our residents in the state of Florida in District 7. So I'm, I'm happy with the opportunity. Thank you very much, FDOT, for considering using SIS to, for transit-related projects. I think it's, it will actually help us in a great way. And if we use that in concert with the other things that I see Catherine, see what the Commissioner Starkey's got her hand up. 
other other safety or other resilient types of um, projects in concert with that will, will help help us get go a long way. So thank you very much, Commissioner Starkey. I see you have your hand. Yeah, I, I just want to um, echo what Commissioner Long was saying about the regional MPO. I, I, you know, if we're not going to get to a uh, opportunity in T Barta, then I think maybe we need to look at a regional MPO because if we're not speaking with one voice, then we're not going to be able to pull down that federal money. Um, this is me talking, not my board, but I am certainly willing to open that door again. Um, I know a number of years ago, we had a discussion on that idea. Uh, I think it was at the Tampa port. Um, I also know some regions in Texas just came together with the regional MPO. So <coughs> I, I would like to explore that discussion a little more. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to just add not 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 so much to the regional MPO discussion, but I was in Washington D.C. Uh, day before yesterday, and uh, we met with USDOT and Housing and Urban Development staff. And I just wanted to share that um, they are working very closely together to align federal funding for transportation investments with um, housing and and housing affordability strategies and they are aligning all of their competitive grants with language that reinforces that linkage between housing and transportation investments. Um, and, and some of that is overt in the criteria for these competitive grants. And some of it is more of just them working together and developing a common framework that is for both formula and discretionary funding. And they encouraged us uh, for any application and for any projects that we wanted to seek federal funding on to really look at that linkage of how we were providing a connection between housing that's affordable or attainable, however you want to define that, uh, and what you're trying to do with your transportation funding. And, and the FDOT has shared a similar observation with this district dedicated revenue is what is the state's what is the state's purpose? What is the state's investment? I mean, correct me if I'm saying anything out of line, but they want to see that you're connecting housing with jobs and job training if the state's going to be invested in that. And I think that's an important linkage to consider. Thank you. Um, you wouldn't have to have any of those presentations for a person to come and talk to us about that, could do you? <laughs> well, we spoke with Maria Zimmerman, who is a special assistant to Secretary Buttigieg. And she is a, she's a planner, so that's good. Uh, but she is in a strategic policy position to direct a lot of these uh, inter, integrated programs. Uh, and there's a lady named Sarah Brundage from HUD uh, who was just in St. Petersburg over the weekend. And so it was kind of nice to have that connection, um, but we'll work on any opportunities we can to bring those folks down that they referred us to the division office in Tallahassee and said that the FHWA office is getting new direction uh, to work more closely with the NPOs uh, around this. And, and, and they clarified that they, the FHWA division office is not an appendage of the state DOT. They are a separate entity and can have that. The only challenge with FHWA is they're really short on staff right now. Um, and that's probably, a, yeah, that's everybody's <laughs> problem. Uh, but I'll be happy to share the guidance that we got uh, as soon as I have something a little more concrete and we can put it in the next agenda. Fabulous. Thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Mr. Aaron. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know when we ever get a chance to have the discussion that's been raised by Commissioner Long and uh, Commissioner Starkey, but I do think that when people look at this Tampa Bay region, you know, and I, I, I brought it up at our commission meetings frequently, Commercial real estate for women always have um, an economist that visits and talks about the power of this region. Um, but it's a region. It doesn't talk about the power of Hillsborough County or the power of Pasco or the power of Pinellas. It really talks about the power of the region. And I don't think we're going to get there. We're not going to maximize that unless we do have more of these discussions about when it comes to economic development. I think there's an element to it. Obviously, Tampa Bay Water is a very successful regional model. But I think when it comes to transportation planning is on, on the funds that are provided by FDOT and, and the state's been, they haven't been, uh, they've been very vocal, at least the legislative side that says, you ought to think about it. 
we did come up a couple of years ago and said that State Road 65, State Road 65, 275 is the number one project. Our, our MPO said that that was the number one project and it's not even in our county, but we said that that we felt was the most important. So you, they told the challenge was to speak with one voice. We don't do it as much as we should. I think as a group together as one MPO, you would have to do that. And it may be a square wheel at first, it really plods along, but I think it'd be rounded in time. Certainly Tampa Bay Water, and I'm a big advocate for that group, was much that way. There's a lot of issues and we still have challenges and issues and we always will. But I think that's the conversation we need to have. And as you, I don't know where we have it, but this is a good place to at least have that discussion or at least uh, make the comment. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Having it in the Regional Planning Council is kind of interesting. <laughs> Um, because that's, I mean, having this conversation here at this location is interesting. So I'll just go there. Sure. Um, yes. May I speak to that for just a minute? Because I sit on the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council as Councilor Citro does. And I really, really think they are underutilized and underappreciated by this group. Because like Tampa Bay Water, if you're looking for a regional entity that has been incredibly successful in spite of lack of state funding, particularly, mm -hmm. they used to all be funded by the state, for those of you that have been around a while. But that stopped several, a couple of administrations ago. And... I think Sean Sullivan has done a remarkable job putting the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council on the map. And they are a planning agency. So I think to discuss the, con have bring the region together and have the conversation, part of our mission at the Regional Planning Council is to be a facilitator for regional issues. So what are we waiting for, Sean? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. And we just did his evaluation, so it won't count for another year. Just throw it up. We're always we are willing to help and participate. Uh, we have you know regular communication with five MPOs in this region. Um, so we're we are here to facilitate and to participate. And I couldn't agree more. You know, having you've heard me say this before, having worked at FTA for a portion of my career. I couldn't agree more with the comments today and that one region, one voice goes a long way from, to work up the food chain into Washington. And if we can help facilitate that discussion, count us in. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that feedback. That's, I think that's a great opportunity there. Um, is there any other discussion regarding the SIS at this point? Um, do we have any action that we need to take? No. Okay, well, thank you very much for the discussion. The next agenda item is actually just a, well, we sort of started this <laughs> to some degree, is a discussion regarding, um, a roundtable discussion regarding safety. And uh, who's going to cover that? Whit, you're going to cover that? I guess I will. Uh, Chelsea gave me a head up right before this meeting, so. <laughs> um, I think what we wanted to do is um, just have a little bit of a discussion about safety. Unfortunately, we've had another tragic fatality uh, this morning uh, in, in our in our region, and uh, I think back to maybe three Fridays ago where we had uh, three pedestrians killed before 7 a.m., uh, one in Pasco, two in Pinellas, and, and there might have been somebody in Hillsboro. Um, so we know that we have we have a problem with safety, and it's and it's been a problem for a long time. We are. Um, I guess I'm also looking at a little bit of context in that the Department of Transportation has offered and um, we are, we're taking them up on that. I think the other MPOs are, are as well to have a safety workshop. Ours is scheduled for October 14th for elected officials to discuss how we can move the needle on safety. And uh, we're also having one with our uh, technical uh, coordinating committee um, for about two hours prior to our next TCC meeting. and. We've gotten, I think, 23 of our 25 local governments to sign the Vision Zero resolution committing to zero deaths by 2045. And we're, we're, we think we'll get all uh, here before long. So um, I'd like to just maybe start this by talking a little bit about some of the things we're doing for safety and let the other staff directors and, and board members chime in. 
first of all, we have changed our prioritization criteria for projects uh, on our uh, multimodal transportation priority list, where safety accounts for 25% of the 100 points uh, that we award for, for projects. Equity is another 25%. So really think of that um, half of the point total is for projects that are aiming to support vulnerable road users in low income or equity areas. And um, so a lot of that is walking and bicycling, lighting uh, projects, um, even better transit projects could, could help support that as well. In addition, we've changed the criteria for our transportation alternatives program uh, to emphasize safety and equity in that program as well. As well, And we're starting to see those projects um, come through. And I mentioned the US 19 frontage roads uh, where we had the department look at a retrofit of that. Those frontage roads were designed to move traffic and nobody goes 35 miles an hour right. on those. And, and you have a lot of weaving and merging issues. And we were out there, we saw that there was a three foot bike lane that had been put in back when you know bike lanes were mandated with every project. And several bicyclists rode past us while we were all standing out there and not a one of them was in that three foot bike lane. They were up on the sidewalk. And so the department said, you know, why, why don't we just widen out the sidewalk and make it an eight foot sidewalk and get rid of the three foot bike lane. And frankly, if that's a better safety solution and that's responding to what people are doing, then maybe that's what we ought to do. So um, they also looked at, you know, do we need two lanes of frontage road everywhere and our board pushed back on, on eliminating those lanes. So I'm not sure we're gonna end up with fewer lanes on the frontage roads, but some design strategies that could, you know, really get people to operate at a 35 mile an hour speed because those frontage roads, uh, and I know I'm talking about one issue, every issue is different, but those frontage roads are meant to have access to adjacent land uses, not to speed through rapidly. So it's, it's really, what's your philosophy and your concept of operations for every road that you're looking at? Um, so I just wanted to start off with maybe a couple of thoughts of, of how we're addressing safety, and I'll turn it over to um, uh, Beth or the PASCO representatives to talk a little bit about how they're doing it. PASCO County MPO is also planning to host a, a workshop for public officials elected and staff on October the 18th, and it will include officials from Pasco, Fernando, and Citrus counties. The MPO also plans to emphasize safety very strongly in its next long-range transportation plan update, and we are also planning to complete a safety action plan within the next year. Excellent, good progress. So safety is paramount in all of our transportation planning activities. What are we doing in Hillsboro? <laughs> what the heck are we doing on safety? <laughs> I was going to let you summarize it because I, I would be here all day. So. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're still very actively working on follow-up from the Vision Zero Action Plan that we adopted six years ago now uh, with resolutions of support from all four local governments and the school district. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think one thing that's been a, a big difference for us, so kind of a, a big sea change over the last 10 years has been in our priority list for the TIP, the list of priority projects. You know, Whit mentioned um, the number of points that um, Pinellas is awarding for safety. Uh, when looking at candidate projects, um, we changed the way that we identify needs. So this is kind of, Richard, this is kind of coming back to why I was asking you about, well, what's on the unfunded needs list? Because uh, what we used to do was uh, identify a bunch of road widening projects that were needed. And then we would look at, well, are some of those in high crash areas? So we think that we're going to fix a crash problem while we're out there. Well, then it gets more points. Is it an evacuation route? Well, then it gets more points. You could spend 50 years working your way through that project list and not move the needle on safety because it does not flag the high crash areas. So we started doing a different needs assessment, which focuses on where are, are people 
in high injury crashes. And that then flags a whole other list of projects. Uh, and our priority list is now structured around that. So at the top of our priority list are our projects focused on um, state of good repair. And that ends up being primarily directed towards heart, towards um, vehicle maintenance and the maintenance facility. And about a quarter of the funds that we prioritize are, are going towards that. Um, the bulk of the remainder of our funds are working their way down the, the crash reduction needs list. We do have other things on our priority list, but because of limited funding, we don't usually get past the safety list. And we've had this discussion as a board. Do we wanna start having set-asides? Do we wanna set aside some for technology? We want to set aside some for trails. And the discussion was, as long as we are looking at the limited funding that we have available for transportation right now, we probably need to stick with good repair and safety at the top of the priority list. Uh, what this has meant is some, um, some high profile safety projects have gotten funded uh, in the last couple of years. So in our, in our last cycle, uh, there's a Bush Boulevard safety retrofit project, uh, which got not only um, our typical surface transportation block grant funding, but an additional allocation because of the stimulus money um, that was allocated to our area. Uh, and that's gonna make a big difference on Bush Boulevard at, um, through a, a very transit dependent and walk bike dependent area. Um, the year before that, it was Fowler Avenue and the multimodal safety improvements uh, on Fowler Avenue. Um, so we're really excited about those projects. I know it's going to be, you know, another few years before, you know, we actually get to the, to the point of, uh, of having those constructed. But, uh, but this is a reflection of the priority that our board is setting. Um, we also, we're gonna have a, a workshop uh, in December uh, on safety with our board and our local governments, um, reviewing what steps were taken on the high injury network uh, over the past calendar year. Um, in February, of course, we review our safety, our crash data, how it's been over the last year, and we set our target for the coming year and we don't set a pie in the sky target. We look at what we can actually afford and where we think we can make a difference. And, and we don't like those numbers. Uh, and this past year we spent a lot, this past February we spent a lot of time talking about, well, how do we make a difference with these numbers when we don't have the funding that we need to have for safety? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we uh, asked all of our partner agencies to do was to focus on the high injury corridors already been flagged. Uh, take another look at the speed management action plan uh, and then come back to us with a workshop at the end of the year and talk about um, what they've been able to do uh, over the past year. Even if it's just putting up signs, um, even if it's just doing targeted enforcement. Um, so we're looking forward to that uh, in December. Of course, we're looking forward to the Gulf Coast Safe Streets Summit. Um, that won't be in the TMA this year, it'll be in Polk. Um, but we're excited to have Polk TPO taking the, the lead this year and um, hosting that in beautiful downtown Lakeland. Um, and uh, I'll just close with a plug for speed management. Speed is the biggest single contributor. And as we are looking at how do we bring deaths and serious injuries down, on road segments like State Route 60 through Brandon, which is in our top 20 and also on the SIS, speed management has gotta be, it's gotta be our biggest priority. Um, when is the, oh, when is the Sun Coast? Uh, it is in your agenda packet. I'm I think so I was the looking for it. Oh, third of November or fourth. Yeah. I didn't see it in there. Either the third or the fourth of November. Of November. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, 
I and I, I think this sort of relates to the conversation we were having earlier with the CIS idea. Um, we we see some improvements in how we're working with the state on state roads. Um, but I, I think what we've discovered sometimes is that you know congestion management always goes prior to the Zuki uh, element when we're looking for solutions on working with state roads. A good example of that is um, the many challenges we've had with you know the north side of 275. Um, you know we've addressed the fact that we've got the expansion of the oak the flyover in order to add safety you know, to the congestion problem for the approach to uh, the downtown interchange from the north. Um, and while adding um, capacity there has potential for increasing safety because people, the backup isn't quite so bad, the roller coaster ride on the way there is, in my opinion, the issue. But that, because of congestion was a little bit higher priority than safety. That's a much bigger project to, to address, um, leveling out that road so you can see that you're about to crash into the back of somebody when you're in the third lane over, because that's really what happens. Because um, you just can't, I mean, there's too many people that don't drive appropriately <laughs> and the lanes stack up and you'll be coming down the center lane of a four or five lane highway and find yourself coming over a hill to a stop car doing 64. So the crash rate there is, is pretty significant. And that may bring safety to the equation in the priority, as well as how we're, we're working with our state is, is critically important. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to continue this effort. Is, is anyone else? Yes. Madam yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I do know we are working with FDOT and Could you they'll... introduce yourself one more time for those that are on the screen uh, or virtual? Hi, this is Christina Fitzpatrick, County Commissioner for Paso County and Paso Expo. Um, we're working on also implementing mid block crosswalks along 19 and also add additional lighting. Some of the other concerns that I was concerned, I would like to know what other counties are doing, is I know there was one weekend within five days within five days we had about five pedestrians struck and two of them one was a 12 year old hit and run and another one was a 12 year old struck and they were on opposite sides of the county within an hour so i know our safe route to schools and making sure we have sidewalks for our kids especially when buses are not picking up and transporting our kids within two miles anymore um and especially if it wasn't a safe route to school. So looking for those pedestrians to make sure we have sidewalks for them. Is anyone looking at other options on how to correct? And I think that Vision Zero should be a top priority for all counties. Great. Yeah, Hillsborough County put in a significant amount of our ARP money towards sidewalks that were urgent. Um, and in, in uh, you know, impacted, disproportionately impacted communities to address the fact that we've got a real safety problem as well. The sidewalks is one of those solutions, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and, and to your point, we did, we did as well. There was a lot of areas we're just trying to close the gaps, you know, so folks have options other than walking up the street. Um, and we have some, some issues too um, in the unincorporated area of the county. We typically don't have a lot of lighting, and, and so we're looking at that as well because there's some so of our school stops in the morning at 6.45 that stark outside and they're trying to navigate the road, you know, and, and kids are kids, you know, they've got the phone in their hand and, you know, trying to cross a road that's not safe. So, yeah, I, there's a lot of things going on. I, I And I think this, this whole safety conversation can't, I don't think can be had enough. Um, one of the, um, one of the things that I think you mentioned that was the speeding. Um, and it really probably is the single most, it, and it's a it's a solvable problem. I don't know what the technologies are out there, and the safety issues that are, or excuse me, public. Um, uh, I guess just the, the you know anybody that might talk about their privacy rights is what I was thinking about. But 
you know, we have the technology at the, at, at when people are going into uh, roads that require, you know, um, stopping, you know, you, you, now you can speed through it, not speed, but get through the, get through the intersection and you have all the lighting and all the cameras and everything else that can check your, your license plate. And we've got to have some more of that because we just don't have enough officers to manage the speed. You guys build us a nice road in US 19 and it's beautiful and it, it makes for, you know, you, you talked about congestion, getting people to and fro, but the traffic speeding is if you're going 55 and that's what the speed limit is, you are in the way and mm -hmm. it's dramatic. It's, it's, it's 65 probably on average, more like 75 and 85. And we just don't have enough officers out there. I mean, they've got other things that are, um, and these are things that are solvable. This isn't big, you know, projects that take a lot of money, but I would like to think about maybe some technology things that we can try out um, on on some of these roads and see, you know, people know they're being watched. And again, we're not talking about anything other than speed here, but um, I think that's a that's a big deal. We've got the technology, you, you guys brought, you know, flashing yellow lights at, at, at intersections, which again, people aren't speeding through red lights now because they know they have this other opportunity to kind of maneuver themselves. Uh, crosswalks that you talked about, block crosswalks, we're looking at those. Um, we've actually, the, the department is bringing a, a, a roundabout to a, a state highway. It's a, it's a two lane highway um, in, in one of, near one of our little un, unincorporated downtowns. And of course, this is dramatic change for the community that is very concerned about what's happening. But it really goes back to the safety issue because there's about a three block area where you got cars coming and going, you've got the trail, you've got all kinds of golf cart crossings. And so we wanted to really slow it down without stopping. So we're going to try a roundabout there. Um, secretary promised me that if it was a disaster, he'd get rid of it real quick. But, uh, and that probably made me feel better. Um, but I do think from a safety perspective, it, 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 you can look globally, but if you don't take a look microscopically at e each of these areas where solutions can be had quickly and rather inexpensively, then we're not making the changes that we can talk all we want, but until we start making these small changes and they're in your backyard, they're in our backyard, Pasco's backyard, um, you know, again, that doesn't mean we don't chase the big ones, but we have to chase these little ones too. So, and, and they are solvable with minimal money. So I'd like to just explore that technology issue on speeding because it's just a big deal. It's a big deal. I'll mention Thank real you. quick, if I may, that we had um, a bill in the legislature last session that, that, that enabled school districts to deploy speed management cameras mm -hmm. uh, within school zones. Uh, it, I believe, passed the Senate, but it did not make progress in the House. And, and that would be one thing that this group could consider, uh, maybe at the December meeting, would be to take a position on that and encourage the House and the Senate to at least give school districts the ability to have uh, speed cameras within school zones. And then another thing that I learned recently is that at least in Pinellas County, not all of our schools have school zones. Um, for high schools, I know it's optional, but we have Eisenhower Elementary on Drew Street in Clearwater, which is a four lane road, no school zone. Um, Gulf to Bay, where Clearwater High School is located, no school zone. And I think in St. Pete, I heard this morning that they have school zones for all of their schools, even their high schools, but that's discretionary is my understanding by the local government. And I'm not sure it should be. Um, so that's something we may wanna look at. I'm not a big fan of preemption, um, but if there's a way to have more consistency and where we have school zones, I know Mayor Bajowski, you worked on the speed for school zones, but I think we still have some inconsistency oh, we, of where they are. We actually talked about insisting and we asked every city to sign i'm not going to throw any city under the bus but there, did. <laughs> you did but there was at least one that refused to do it because their schools are on such major roads um the city of dunedin is actually taken it so far as um even our montessori school has a school zone but yes our high school i mean every single if it's a school not daycare per se but if it's a school it has a school zone um and and a number of cities in Pinell, and as we said we have 24 of them a number of them agreed and signed on to that and passed that but yeah definitely clearwater was not interested yeah i i have a we have a school um a, it's actually a high school that's right off the hillsborough yeah. avenue which is oh you know very busy high crash 
intersection at 22nd and there's a, you know a Just huge affordable housing mm -hmm. project that's on on the way so there will be i don't know what is that 100 units what is the fun way um, there, there's a big piece of property a lot of a lot of a lot of homes are being built there and as soon as one of the smaller communities was built there and kids started crossing hillsborough avenue we started seeing significant children injured I too was disappointed to see that the house did not support that, that bill. Uh, would be very interested in um, having this board consider a letter of support if there's an opportunity to do so, to really address the need to keep our kids safe. Um, I know Hillsborough County is also really looking at, I, I've brought it to our comp plan and our land use folks, um, as it does, uh, in looking at our road design for communities as they're as they're built in our rural areas, because part of the reason there's no lighting in a lot of these places or there's no sidewalks is because they weren't required. And now we're finding that's more and more there's an opportunity to improve that infrastructure, especially if it's anything other than you know a senior community where most of it is going to either be in the golf cart or a car, and, and maybe. Um, but Commissioner, on, on that point, um, we stopped allowing, I mean, I'm just interjecting here, we stopped allowing like gated communities not to have side, you know, they thought if it's gated, we're going to take care of the road and we're, we, we don't need sidewalks, caca, because <laughs> eventually it all comes back to the city. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, I so we don't that allow that. Long time. I got to write that one down. I, I have a seven-year-old. I need to learn gonna, these. Yeah, you got to have those uh, <laughs> those off-color words. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but we stop allowing that because it all ends up coming back to us in the in the and end. end. And, and it, it gives up lives too. And that's obviously that's something we do not think is um, a value judgment that we'd like. To it is. Through. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, and I know when we discuss and have new developments coming in, one of the questions, and we have another commissioner very strongly that advocates for our trails and sidewalks. But we do discuss and make sure that they have the sidewalks within the development and also coming out of the development, especially if it's connecting to a school, we're discussing it every time it comes in front of the board. Um, what Mr. Blanton was saying before, I, what I had written down, but just like we have red light cameras and some are for and against it, but what about the yellow flashing signs that Show the speed as well because it reduces about 70 percent and slows down the speed about 70 percent but what if they had a radar gun on it that would check the speed and i don't know if that's what was going through legislature but if they had the speed on it and then the cameras could take a flash of the plate just like a red light camera but do it for speed you mean just like our toll roads take a picture of our tags when we go through? I think that's the technology. <laughs> yes, but also taking the speed yeah. and then sending tickets out just like a red light camera. So you're kind of integrating the two devices into one. Right. Or even if it wasn't overhead, just on the sign facing sideways. And I joke when I spoke to the sheriff because sometimes all counties, I'm going to say in general, the broad and the scope is they'll put a law enforcement vehicle on the side of the road. There may not be a law enforcement officer inside of it, but maybe if we could create a technology that when someone speeds by, the lights start flashing red and blue. And <laughs> it was a joke because they're like, well, if we had that technology, that would be pretty interesting. But I guess we don't have that technology, but we do have technology that it can flash yellow. So how could we create the technology to flash red and blue? So I think that would be something to look at. Sorry, we found the definition of caca. That's what we're all laughing at. I'm sorry. And it's and it's so right, the funny. Children's corner over here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's Friday. I'm sorry, please repeat your last sentence. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. So what I was saying is if they were speeding by the vehicle that did not have a law enforcement officer in it, but it could catch their speed, start flashing the red and blue lights. I think that would definitely slow down traffic. And then if we were joking because we don't really have the technology to do that right now, but if we can have the technology to flash the yellow lights when they speed by or to slow down, then it shouldn't be too difficult to replicate that and just put it on top of a law enforcement vehicle 
to slow them down. I love having the you know the woman standing out there with a dryer and making it look like it's a, a speed gun, yeah. but but it, ironically it does get people's attention. And you know anything we can do to to adopt policies and procedures, road design, different strategies that can address the fact that speed kills. I mean, it, no matter whether it's at 35 or 85, you know, it does need to be taken into consideration where it interfaces with not only other cars, but but cyclists, walkers, you know, children specifically. And can we prepare a, or make a motion to have a letter of support written by our next meeting so we could make the motion to send it? Uh, I don't see why not. Okay, sure. I would like to make I that motion. We're going into committee soon, so I mean, not right away, but yeah. it'll give us an opportunity to have one ready and when they go back into committee. We need a motion to draft a letter or just a motion to send the letter? Yeah. Well, let's hold, I want your vote. Uh, <laughs> so, you need, would you like to make a motion? Yes. Yeah. Motion to prepare, uh, draft a letter and have it ready by the next meeting so we could submit it to legislature. Second. We have a second by, um, we have a, I can't see. Mayor Julie. Mayor Julie, there's a second. Um, it's in the Kager vote. Aye. 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 We'll have it on the next meeting to come. Thank you. For consideration. Uh, anything else? Okay. We actually, considering we started late. Oh, sorry. That's all right, Madam Chair. You have a lot of work to look at. Uh, I don't want to put any bad mojo on the next couple of weeks, but we are in the of our hurricane season. Mm. If next meeting we can have some sort of discussion revolving around transportation and evacuation, whether it be two blocks away to get to the shelter, getting out of Pinellas County, going to Hillsboro to get to Orlando. I, since I've been a part of this, I don't think we've had a, a discussion. Just a discussion about transportation and evacuation. Yeah. Okay. We did that. We did. We have done that. I just don't recall when we did I, that. Then maybe time to do it again. Yeah. Recall. <laughs> we had some conversation at the Reach Conference regarding that. We did that. Sullivan, maybe yeah. you can give us some guidance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy to. Uh, we developed a uh, an award winning, and I say award winning because the governor's uh, office uh, did. Uh, give us an award for our Hurricane Phoenix 2.0 video. Uh, it's about 22 minutes in length, which might be a bit long for this meeting, but we also shortened it up to about an eight minute segment that might help hit home the point that uh, uh, Councilman Cedro is making, and we'll be happy to make that available at your next meeting. Um, could I ask you to send out an email with links to those two presentations, the short one as well as the long one, and that way we'll have that before our next meeting or have an opportunity to see it before the next meeting and we can at least open it up for a discussion. Uh, for Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy Thank to you. Do it. And that would be wonderful. Um, we are looking at potentially storm impacts at the end of next week, so can't happen fast enough. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Could I make one comment about safety? And I don't want to beat the dead horse, but I tend to agree with Beth that speed is clearly the, 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 the primary reason of, of deaths, traffic deaths. And I think of Hillsborough TPO really as being a leader with the Vision Zero Initiative. I remember, Beth, when you, you and your team brought that on. And in fact, I remember being at a meeting in Hillsborough County, if I'm not mistaken, it was at the Stras, when there was a bike outside, uh, which was an example of someone who was hit by a vehicle while, bi while biking. And that's just one that resonates. And I also think of your efforts and your team when I see the, the alert today, alive tomorrow, F dot video uh, or commercial on TV, because I remember seeing that initially at your shop. And with you and your team, uh, recently in the newspaper, I think there were three different articles about the sophomore at Lago High School that was killed on Bellia Road. Tragic. I know I saw one night on Fox 13 talking about this uh, in the region, and then your comments in the paper, I think it was just this past Sunday. Uh, I couldn't agree more that speed is the issue, but real quick, uh, I have State Farm as my auto insurer. And when I renewed this year, I opted in, which is an option for a device that's about the size of a small uh, Tic Tac uh, container, and it's metal, and uh, it comes with a couple of stick-ons. You stick it on under your, your rear view mirror in your vehicle, and you tie it into your phone just once. And every time I get in my vehicle, uh, it knows the speed of the road and the speed that I'm doing. And it's really made to help you get points if you drive responsibly. So a, a personal story, my wife and I came back 
uh, to this uh, this part of the county because we don't live far from the office from a, an event in uh, Clearwater last Friday night, a uh, Saturday night. And I purposely took Bellia Road home because I know there have been a recent pedestrian accident. And the speed limit predominantly, as I seem to recall, is about 35 miles an hour. So I made a point to only go 35 miles an hour. One, in the back of my mind, I know I get dinged on my insurance if I don't. And two, I wanted to just see what it's like to drive at night on a road and actually obey the speed limit. And I could tell you, there were a line of cars behind me. I had one uh, car behind me flashing their lights. And when I got to the uh, intersection at 19 and stopped at the red light, I won't repeat the gesture that was made to me, but all I was doing was following the law. But I think that device, and talking about working with the legislature, if we could make that device mandatory, then every person who drives recklessly, as well, speeds uh, recklessly, will pay more in their insurance. So if you're gonna abuse the privilege of not obeying the law, then you pay more, mm. uh, just a thought. You know, it's interesting you should bring that up. I've noticed in, when I've used, because I, I have to go a lot of places, I don't know where I'm going. I mean, I literally, like, I'm just going to try and figure out which way. And since I hate getting, no offense, on any of our highways, I'm always looking for another way to get there. And even though maps and Google Maps all want to put you on the highway, um, I tend to choose the other alternative. Uh, and, but I've noticed that every time I'm on a highway and I have the map up and it's telling me which exit's coming up and that kind of thing, it will tell you how fast you're going or it will tell you how what the speed limit is on the road. So we have the technology. It's in our phones. It's in our cars. It's, you know, it's on the various devices that are used to take and credit our account for the toll road we just ran through. You know, it, we have the technology. So I think they're exploring these opportunities in order to effectively use that technology to address safety um, and hold people accountable for breaking the law. I think it might not be a bad idea, you know, because I've had similar responses when you're following the speed limit and people just act like you're not capable of driving safely when you are the one that is. And that's unfortunate. And Madam Chair. Yes, um, ma'am. MapQuest absolutely has that. I make sure I MapQuest regardless if I'm if I know where I'm going or not. Because one, it shows me the, the the speed, and two, it shows me how to take alternative routes. But maybe implementing that as a mandatory for people that have a DUI or have so many speeding tickets, but then also use it as an incentive to maybe legislature can mandate that insurance companies do give discounts related to utilizing the device. And, regu and and driving at the regulated speed. Correct. That would be awesome. I mean, what a great risk management strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we might have some allies there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. This has been an excellent discussion. Thank you very, very much. Are there any other inputs? Okay, well, that is the last item on our agenda. Is there any new business or old business? We're gonna cover a couple of things at the next meeting. It's been discussed today, but with that, I will call the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Thank you. And safe driving back to wherever yeah. we <laughs> Yes. It probably from the words a little or two eleven in the morning.